In keeping with the difficulty of the rear monocoque and the whole, um, everything after the transport joint on the Typhoon being difficult and uh, having sparse information and sparse surviving parts, the fin is no different. Um, in the early design, it was really important that we identified which fin the Typhoon flew with because it became apparent that there was actually several variants of the fin design that went through production. The early Typhoons had uh, their own unique fin and we really don't have a lot of data on that. It didn't last long. Um, but the primary fin type that was used up um, and used in Hawker Typhoon JP843 is also the same fin design as used in Hawker Typhoon MN235 that survives in Hendon. Um, there was a later variant of fin used on the Typhoon and it's not the Tempest fin. The Tempest fin was completely different, a, a absolute redesign of the whole thing. But we've found a private collector that has a later Hawker Typhoon fin and we've taken measurements and verified that the later fin type is approximately one inch thinner than the fin that was used on JP843 and MN235. So isolating all that stuff was really important for us and then we could focus on the geometry that we needed for some of the missing components within the fin design that we knew we were building. So if you look at this rendering, it's kind of cool. It's, uh, this is the fin structure design that Martin Oldfield has put together. Uh, and it includes the uh, the rudder spar on there, a little bit of eye candy. So when we get into the fin structure itself, um, you'll notice that there's a series of horizontal ribs and there are three vertical ribs. Now, we've already built up all of the horizontal ribs. They're all here and they're ready to go. Um, but the vertical ribs need to be produced still. So if you look at the front fin rib, which is this one, you'll notice that um, it actually splits some of the, uh, the horizontal ribs on either side. So the, the, the horizontal ribs are two pieces that get riveted together around this or sandwich the, uh, the vertical rib. And then moving aft, you'll notice that there is a, uh, another rib. This one's actually just called the vertical rib that's of lighter gauge construction. And um, aft, even further, you'll see what they call the fin post, which is another vertical rib. But this one is actually just of plate construction. It still has lightning holes but it doesn't have formed flanges on it. It uses um, uh, extruded T-sections that get riveted to this. And this is the most, uh, um, I guess, the heaviest gauge structure that's used on the fin itself. So these are then covered in aluminum and they've got the um, uh, leading edge that's of interesting construction too. It'll be quite interesting to make. Um, so what we've got uh, built already, as I say, is all of the horizontal ribs are ready to go. They're ready for heat treatment. They're produced out of O material. And um, what I need to build with, that has formed flanges that I will be building out of O material are the, uh, the front fin post and the vertical rib. So that's what I'm working on today. I've taken the data that uh, Martin Oldfield has sent over to me and um, plotted it out on the laser on MDF, our medium density fiber board for the form blocks, as well as on the material. Two different material thicknesses here. The front fin post is of 40 thousandths of an inch and the, um, the vertical rib is 32 thousandths of an inch. So today I'll run you through producing form blocks, uh, trimming out the flat patterns and then producing the ribs that we need to go in this batch of heat treatment. When I mention the angles that Martin puts into the form blocks for me, it's, it's very handy for cutting and basically what it is, it's the inside mold line, um, but it's the inside mold line um, for the beginning of the bend is that inside line right there. And the outside line is the inside mold line uh, projected at the angle of the flange over the thickness of the form block. So I know that I can cut the outside line and then finish up um, to the inside line with my sanding and filing or cutting, depending how I do it, and it'll be the correct angle. It's beautiful stuff. It makes work quite easy with that. And I've also got these guys um, trimmed out now. These are just the flat patterns. See if I can get that uh, that line visible where the lightning holes are. Should be able to see that there. So they've been marked out and they're trimmed uh, pretty rough right now. I still have more work to do on that. But for now, let's get to cutting that wood and uh, working on our form blocks. So these are roughed out now. Uh, you'll notice that I did 
what looks like two of each, but they're not. Uh, essentially, you can see the double lines still on there. That's where I'll be putting some shape to these, and those are the actual form blocks. Um, and like I say, that'll be the, the angle of the flanges once they're shaped. These ones don't have the secondary line. They're cut back to the first line and will be used as the backing block. With the flat patterns, before I bend any flanges, I actually uh, cut and then press out the lightning holes first. So these will be on here with lightning holes and they'll need to be a relief where the lightning hole sits, just like with this guy here. It'll have to sit down into the form block. So these will go on there and they'll get clamped down and then I can just uh, plop the router on there, run it through and I get a nice true hole on them. And then we'll have the reliefs on all of our, or on both of the form block sides and we can uh, start working on shaping the form block itself. Just to clear the bench, I'm going to take the uh, the backing blocks for both of these and I'll just clean them up really quickly, knock off the sharp edge and uh, put them aside so we can deal with the uh, the angles on the form blocks themselves. So to be begin the profiling process, I take it to the bandsaw and I tilt the table. Um, what I do is I take the largest angle here and I'll set the table to cut that and cut all the way along there. And basically it'll, um, it'll only take off this, the bulk of the material on this edge, but it'll take it off all the way down at the, uh, where the most material needs to be removed. So it works quite well that way um, and it'll save a lot of filing and profile work. They're gonna be different from uh, part to part. So I'll start with the most aggressive angle, which is the uh, front fin post here. And I'll set the table on the bandsaw to, to cut this part here. So really nothing too fancy with that. Uh, it cut a really nice angle and it definitely took off the bulk of the material that needs to be removed on this. This is a nice little indicator here of what came off and you can see that as well changes as it went along the cut line. So now you can see that we've got the top line uh, still visible there which is good, that's our inside mold line. It'll have to be radius, but we'll take care of the flange angle first. And um, the one edge that's really important to preserve is this back edge right here. And that's because that's the one that sets the angle between the inside mold line and the back edge of the wood. And I, uh, I leave a little witness line on there. And that way I know if I hit it with the file and that line disappears that I've been altering the geometry of the part. So simple stuff, but it's good to have that there and I can make sure that I'm holding the, the files at the correct angle so as not to change the angle. So I'll be watching to make sure I don't touch this line or go, don't go beyond that line and that I don't remove our witness mark and um, we'll end up with the correct angle.
Now that I've got this shaped out here, uh, you saw me draw filing. I needed to make sure that this was actually flat instead of putting a crown on it. So now it's flat, it's at the correct angle, and now the important part is the radius for the uh, material to bend around. Obviously not 90 degrees there, so I'll use this part of the radius gauge here boop, boop, um, to make sure I've got the correct radius, and it's not going to take much. It looks pretty good. And that's all it took. Now I've got that nice radius on there for the bend. Um, we've got our angle on this side and I'll flip the block over, do the exact same on this side, and then repeat it almost exactly on the uh, vertical rib with the exception of an even tighter radius on that because the material's thinner. They've specified a 1 16th radius. So um, onwards and upwards. So there's our form blocks all finished up. Um, you can see the profile difference between the, uh, the backing block here and the form block down here. This is the fin post, so it's got a really drastic angle, especially towards the top here, where um, it really does approach the leading edge of the, um, the fin itself. And actually, the way that it's formed, it's got flanges that actually help attach to the leading edge. It's that close. The second one is also finished. We've got our lightning hole reliefs. This one's definitely not anywhere near as drastic. This is the, um, the vertical rib that's uh, kind of centered uh, towards the top half, centered between the rear stern or the rear fin post and the front fin post. So again, this one's a little bit thinner as well. Super tight radii on it, but um, that's what uh, Sir Sidney Cam desired. That's what Sir Sidney Cam will get. So we'll move on to the uh, the flat patterns, and the flat patterns here are um, still kind of in their roughed out profile. I've got a little bit of work to do on them. The first thing that I'm going to do is take, if you can see them, all the laser marked tooling holes, and we'll. Um, where's the other one? Oh, this one has one up at the top. This one is the vertical, um, the vertical rib, and it actually doesn't have a tooling hole at the top. So it's got a five eighths hole. But while we do the forming, I'm actually just going to pop a tooling hole in there, or use it as a tooling hole at three sixteenths. And then when the part's done, I'll um, increase the size up to five eighths. It'll just help stabilize the part in the form blocks. Uh, so we'll center punch all the tooling holes, center punch all of the uh, lightning hole centers as well and just pop a pilot in them. And I'll probably be using a, a 332 pilot to get everything started and we'll go from there. Um, first step will be to increase them up to a 3 16th on the tooling holes, but all the center holes for these uh, lightning holes on both components will stay as 332 to act as a center for our tooling on the next step. Okay, so I forgot to turn the camera on, but <laughs> I drilled up the um, the tooling holes only to our 3 16 size, which is the final size for those guys. And uh, now I'm going to take these blanks over to the Rotex punch. And uh, unfortunately, my 2-inch die, there's a better, you can see this one better. Unfortunately, my 2-inch die set is out of commission, so we'll have to use, uh, for 2-inch and larger, use the fly cutter. But uh, as of now, we'll use the three quarter, the one, and the one and a half. As well on this one, um, I'll be using the 1.25 inch cutter. And uh, we'll knock those guys out and uh, then move on to fly cutter work. You'll notice that I've, uh, on, on the blanks, I've left those three thirty second holes in the centers. And that's because the bottom of the die actually has a uh, centering point on it. So it'll help line that up properly. So I can wiggle it and feel that it's 
centered nicely and then just uh, there we go three quarter inch hole done We'll start at two inches with the fly cutter and um, you'll notice that they were still at the uh, 330 seconds pilot holes here. The fly cutter uses a quarter inch pilot and um, they're actually typically a very poor quality drill bit. So what I do with that is I'm going to blow this, um, uh, the pilot, the 330 seconds pilot up to a quarter inch and then this will just guide it and uh, keep it steady as it cuts. Now, once that's done, I'll mount this, and I've got to set this to the right uh, dimension, which is from the center of the drill bit to the outside of the cutting area. Um, you'll notice the direction of the blade, it's going to cut on the outside, to, uh, so the tapered part will be on the blank on the inside, that's our scrap, where the outside is important. Um, so I'll measure it, I'll dial it all in, and then I'll, uh, I'll lock it in place, and then I'll take a test cut on a scrap piece to make sure the whole size is what I want it to be. 